So we're going to be doing algebraic operations of functions. So let me just describe what that is uh, quickly. So uh, just like with numbers, um, we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions. Okay. So like we want to extend the operations that we can do on numbers, but to functions, all right? So this is how we do it. This is how we do it. So for, so for two functions, uh, call them uh, f of x and g of x, we define, okay, so we're going to, define uh, the sum of two functions, the difference, the product, and the quotient. Okay, so let's show, so let me just get that written down. So the sum f plus g evaluated at x, this is defined to be what you think it should be. It's just f of x plus g of x. Okay, so functions are added together point-wise. All right, so that's for addition. Subtraction is um, pretty much the same. So uh, the difference of f minus g evaluated at x, that's defined to be f of x minus g of x. Okay, so it's exactly what you would expect it to be. Um, similarly, we have uh, the product function. So we define fg evaluated at x to be the pointwise product f of x times g of x, okay? And the last one, uh, the quotient, if we want uh, f, to g, f divided by g evaluated at x, it's just a pointwise quotient, f of x divided by g of x. However, we need to stipulate that um, g of x is not zero, of course. Okay, so these are maybe things that you have like taken for granted in previous math classes, like what does it mean to add two functions, but we're just being very formal here. Um, so these are the definitions of adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, All right? And they're exactly what you would expect them to be. So let's just do like an example quickly. Um, let's, let's let f of x be x minus one and g of x to be x squared minus one. All right, and the, and the task is to find uh, two things. We want to find g minus f evaluated at x and the quotient g over f evaluated at x. Okay. All right, so this is really not that bad. So let's just, let's just do the first one. First, uh, let's do the uh, subtraction. So g minus f evaluated at x. That's first of all, that is defined to be g of x minus f of x. Okay, so the first equal sign is just by um, definition. Okay, and now let's just uh, plug in our information. g of x is uh, x squared minus one. And now I bring down the minus sign, open up parentheses, and f of x is x minus one. Good, now I can distribute the minus sign. It would be x squared minus one minus x plus one. Um, the, the ones cancel, so the, the, the final answer would just be x squared minus x. All right, and, and if you'd like, you can factor an x out and make it x times x minus one. All right, but that step would be um, optional, I guess. Are we consider them to be equal again? I'm sorry. Excuse me? Why do we um, equal them together? Again? What do you mean equal them together? I mean like we, we uh, oh, okay, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was thinking of something else. I see. I, I thought maybe you, I thought maybe you equal them together to solve. Oh, no, um, this equal sign is just by the definition of what it means to subtract two functions. Yeah, I'm not setting anything equal to each other. And let's do the other one. So the other one, we're just asked to find the quotient g over f of x. So let's just do that. 
So g over f evaluated at x. So the first equal sign is just the definition. So the definition tells us it's just g of x divided by f of x. Okay, and that's by the definition. All right, cool. Um, so the g of x, I'm just going to replace with uh, x squared minus one. And the f of x is x minus one. And I could factor the numerator as x minus one times x plus one. And the x minus one stays. Um, and now I can just cancel some factors. So the x minus ones in the top and bottom cancel. And the answer is just x plus one. All right, so that would be the answer. So we're not doing anything uh, crazy here or anything unexpected. Um, we're just kind of formalizing these algebraic operations with uh, functions. All right, so any questions on any of these calculations? All right, so let's kind of get to the heart of tonight's lecture. So the so kind of the main thing we're going to be doing tonight is something called um, composition of functions. So this is actually a very important, very important topic. It pops up everywhere in mathematics. If you take Calc 1, you're going to be dealing with composition of functions quite often. Um, so uh, this is definitely, definitely important to cover. All right, so we're going to start off with a definition. Okay, so here we go. So given two functions, given two functions, um, f of x and g of x, we we define the composite function. So that's what I'm going to be defining. So I'll underline it. We define the composite function as such. Okay, so the notation looks like this. It's f with a little bubble g and then evaluated at x. And this is defined. So this equal sign is a definition. So here, this is what it is. It's f evaluated at g of x, okay? Okay, so obviously we're gonna talk about this more and I will explain this more, but just, um, just a quick note about this. In, in the notation, so in the notation, so on the right side of that equal sign, f of g of x, um, so x is the x is the input of g. So I hope everyone sees that. It's g of x. So x is the input of g. Um, but what's different here is that uh, g of x is the input of f. Okay, so we're not just plugging in x into f, we're actually plugging in the whole function g of x. Okay, so that's one thing. And now just a, okay, and now just a warning. Um, it does not mean to multiply f and g. So some people I've seen confused in the past that this notation, it kind of looks like f being multiplied by g. Um, it does not mean that. Okay, so, so it will be clear upon context whether we're multiplying or doing composition. So it does not mean uh, to multiply f and g. All right. Uh, All right, um, so let's just get to an example now. Let's get to an example. So an example should clear um, any confusions up. So I'm going to let f of x equal x to the second power and okay. f of x equal to x plus two. 
All right, and the task is to find, um, okay, and the task is to find uh, f of g of x, or the composition, f of g of x, and also the other composition, g of f of x. All right, so that's what we're being asked to do. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, talk about how this is going to look. Um, let's first look at the first one, f of g of x. I'm going to write that. Let's first look at this guy, f of g of x. Okay, so first of all, what is g of x? g of x is x plus 2. So let me replace that in the parentheses with x plus 2. So this is the same as f evaluated at x plus 2. All right, so I hope that's clear. I'm just replacing g of x with what it, it uh, with its definition. g of x is x plus 2. So I'm going to replace that. And now, wherever I see an x in the formula for f, I replace that with x plus 2. So I input x plus 2 into the function f. So there's an x here, so I replace the x with x plus 2. And then the power of 2 stays. All right, so what happened here was, so we input um, x plus 2 into f of x. So that's the difference here. I'm not just plugging in x, I'm plugging in the quantity x plus 2. And that's how I got this. That's x plus 2 squared. And then um, if you wish, you can multiply this out and you would get x squared plus 4x plus 4. All right, so this is um, very important. Um, so if anyone's confused, please let me know. Um, but we're going to be doing a lot more. All right, so now let's do the other one. Uh, I also said, let's find uh, g of f of x. So we just did f of g of x, let's do g of f of x. So g of f of x equals. Okay, so first I'm just gonna bring down the g and now I'm going to replace f of x with its formula. So f of x, let me scroll up here, f of x is x squared. So I replace the input for g with x squared. All right, because that's what f of x is defined to be. And now I go to the formula for g, and wherever I see an x in the formula for g, I On e7 to the e5. Oh. Yeah, so someone's mic is on. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so I, well, what was I saying? Um, okay, so you go to the formula for G, wherever you see an X there, you replace that with X squared. Okay, so it's X plus two. I'm gonna replace the X with X squared, so it's X squared plus two. So X squared plus two. So what did I do here? I inputted X squared, um, in for x in the function g. So I hope, um, um, Saeed, uh, your mic is, is on. Oh, sorry about that. Making some noise. It's okay. Um, all right, so is everyone okay with this example? Okay, so just- I'm okay with, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm okay with the example, but I have a question. Like, can you, instead of doing just two, like three, like one, two inside one, like, oh, uh, yeah. let's say there's an H, an H inside the G and the G inside the F. Like, uh, is that a thing or? Yeah, you can do as many compositions in a row as you want. Um, so there's actually something in math you can do like F N of X. And this would be f composed with itself um, n times. And 
in some crazy areas of math, you can let n tend to infinity, which is like composing f with itself infinitely many times and see if you get some sort of meaningful result. So that's really cool. And that's an area of math called um, dynamics. So that's some cool stuff. Um, but yes, you can definitely take many compositions. As good. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course. That's cool. Um, yeah, so this is just an aside thing. Good. Okay, so just the um, intuition. So I was kind of um, hinting at this. The intuition is so to find the composition, so to find um, f of g of x, basically what you do is wherever you see an x in f of x's formula, wherever you see an x in f of x's formula, you replace it with g of x. You replace it with g of x. So that's really what you have to do to find the composition. All right, you just replace x with g of x. All right, so let's do some more practice. Okay, actually, hold on, just one more, one more quick note, um, which is going to show up on the homework, actually. <clears throat> um, the the previous example shows that um, f of g of x does not equal g of f of x. Okay, so I hope everyone sees that. I'm going to scroll up and just highlight that point. So we got that f of g of x was x squared plus 4x plus 4. But when we did the composition in the other order, g of f of x, that, that came out to be x squared plus 2. So these, these two functions we obtained are clearly not equal. All right? So just to be, so to kind of to put some language to this, uh, to what's going on, thus, uh, function composition, function composition is not commutative is not commutative. Okay, so in other words, the order matters. It's not like when we just add together real numbers, you can do, you can add them in any order and it doesn't matter. In this case, function composition, the order does matter because depending on the order, you're gonna get different answers in general. So that's just something very important to note out. Function composition is not commutative. All right, so let's go and let's go back and do some more examples, okay? Let's try and reinforce this idea. Um, all right, so I'm gonna let f of x be equal to 2x plus one, and I'm gonna let g of x be equal to three minus x. All right, and, and the task is just going to be to find both compositions again. Let's find f of g of x and also the other one, g of f of x. Okay. And again, here we're going to see an instance where the order of composition matters. We're going to get different answers for both of these guys. All right, so let's do the first one. Let's do uh, f of g of x. So f of g of x. This equals f of, <clears throat> okay, so f of what is f of g of x. So let me go to the formula for g of x and plug that in. So it's just f of three minus x, because that's the formula for g. Now, wherever I see an, an x in f's formula, I plug in three minus x. So Look at the x here in f's formula. I'm going to replace that x that I just highlighted with 3 minus x plus 1. All right, so the highlighted bit is what I plugged in for x. So I hope that's clear. Um, and now you can just do some algebra. 
this would be 6 minus 2x plus 1, and this comes out to negative 2x plus 7. Alrighty. All right, so the most important step is going from here to here. All right, let's now let's do the other one. Let's do g of f of x. Let's do g Can you just of. Can explain where you got the two from? Yeah, so there's a coefficient of two in front of x. Uh, okay, got it. Yep. Okay. All right, so the other guy is uh, g of f of x. So again, I'm, I'm just going to write g and open up a parenthesis. And let me just replace f of x f of x with its formula. And f of x has a formula of 2x plus 1. So this is the same as g evaluated at 2x plus 1. Cool. And now when I go to g's formula, wherever I see an x, I plug in 2x plus 1. So there's a 3 minus x. So I do 3 minus 2x plus 1. 3 minus parentheses. 2x plus 1. Okay, so the highlighted portion was what I plugged in for x. All right, and just notice that the parentheses are very important. Okay, you can't just do 3 minus and then plop down 2x plus 1. You need to put parentheses around it. Um, um Professor Robbins? Yeah? Um, what do you do um, with the extra x? What do you do with the extra x from g's function? With the extra x? Um, wait, so what are you asking exactly? Like, um, do you use the minus x for anything? Uh, I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking. Um, so are you confused going from here to here? Like the equation is 3 minus x. Uh, do you add like the additional x to the oh. problem? I see what you're saying. Yes, it's 3 minus x. You're right in saying that. However, I need to plug in 2x plus 1 in for x. So I went to this x in the formula, and I replaced that x with 2x plus 1. Okay, thank you. Right, so that, so that x turned into 2x plus 1. Yeah. And now um, you can just... Uh, clean this up a bit. You can distribute the minus sign if you wish. So it's 3 minus 2x minus 1, and this will be what? Uh, negative 2x plus 2. Okay. So again, we witnessed the phenomenon of function composition not being commutative. f of g of x here was not the same as g of f of x. Okay, we got two different functions. All right, so that's just something important to highlight. All right, let me, all right, so what are we gonna do now? Okay, so now we're gonna just evaluate compositions of functions in table form. All right, so using a table. <clears throat> to evaluate a uh, composite function. Okay, so um, I think I have an image for this one. Yes, so just give me one second while I pull this up. Table composite image. Okay, um, so, so, the, so the task is uh, in the image already. Uh, we we want to find f of g of 3 and g of f of 3. Okay, so f of g of 3. Okay, so let's first do that one. So we're first going to do f of g of 3, okay? All right, so again, I'm just going to write f, and then I'm just going to open up a parenthesis. Now, I replace g of 3 with whatever its value is on the table. So I go to g of x, and I go to the column where you plug in 3, and that's actually right here. 
okay? This is G evaluated at the X value of three. So it's two, all right? So it's two. So this is F of two now. And now I need to use the column for F to get uh, F of two. So I go over here, F of two, and F of two is eight. All right, so this is all read from the table. All right, so any questions with how I obtained this, these numbers? All right, let's do one more. All right, let's do G of F of three. So, G. Okay, so I wrote G and I opened up a parenthesis. I'm going to replace F of three, which with whatever its value is. So F of three, I go to the three, I go to three in the X's and F of three is given to us as three. So it's now G of three. And now I just use the table to evaluate G of three. And that was two, as previously stated. Okay. Okay, so that's pretty much it for this example. Uh, basically, this example just comes down to knowing how to read functions off of a table, which we did last time, so hopefully it's, it's okay. All right, so any questions? Okay, so... Um, so we just did it in table form. Now let's do it from uh, from a graph. So using a graph to using a graph to evaluate a composite function. So it's gonna be the same kind of deal. Okay, and this I also have on an image. So just give me one second. Okay, so we want f of g of one. So let me just write that. If you want to make this a little smaller. Okay, so we want um, f of g of one. Okay, so um, first, as as I've been doing, I'm just going to put f and open up a parenthesis. Now we need to fill in the data for what g of one is. All right, so this hopefully can be read off from the graph. Um, hopefully it's not too small for you guys, but Anyways, g of 1 is we just go to 1 on the x-axis and see where it hits the graph. And that's at, at 3. All right, so g of 1 is 3. So that's now f of 3. And now we go to the graph for f. I go to 3, and I see where it hits, hits the graph here. And that's at y equals 6. So this is just 6. All right, so let me just make this, uh, I'm just gonna make this a little bigger. Hold on. I'm gonna shift my drawings. Okay, so, um, yeah, so just let me know if there are any uh, questions about this, but. Hopefully it's pretty straightforward. All right, so we'll get more practice on this on, on the homework uh, on the homework that will be available tonight. All right, next let's now. So we've done table, we've done graph. Now let's do it by formula. So um, wait, wait a second. Uh, I'm sorry before you jump to that. Uh, can you find like the domain and range in the graph in this okay in this situation or like because one side of the other you can find like the domain and range of the final thing like are them together about, are you talking about the domain of the composition yes yeah so we're going to do that in probably like 15 minutes from now or like 10 minutes but like you can read it from the graph uh, or let me read it from the graph so it looks like to me, um, the domain of both of these functions is all real numbers. 
Okay. Because there's no like vertical asymptotes or horizontal asymptotes, which we'll get to. Um, but yep. it looks like, so in this case, the, the, the domain of the composition, uh, there are no restrictions. So it looks like it's going to be all real numbers. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna be, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna do that uh, in just a bit. All right, and finally using a formula uh, to find, uh, no, not to find, to evaluate, excuse me. Using a formula to evaluate a composite function. <clears throat> okay, so here's the example. Um, so I'm going to let f of x be x squared minus x, and I'm just going to use a slightly different letter. I've been using g for the other function. Now let me just use h of x. So it doesn't matter. It's just a different letter. Um, h of x I will let to be 3x plus 2. And the task is to find... Um, f of h of 1. Find f of h of 1. Okay, so, the, so, so these kinds of things you need to work from the inside out, all right? Because, yeah, that's just how it works. So h of 1 we need to find first. So let's just take care of that. So first, so first find uh, the inside which is h of 1. Okay, h of 1, all that means is, is that I go to the formula for h of x and I plug in 1 for x. So that's just 3 times 1 plus 2, um, which is just 5. Okay, very good. And now, now we're pretty much done. So now we look at f of h of 1. Well, we just found out that this input h of 1 is equal to 5, so I'm going to replace that with 5. That's f of 5. Okay, so the 5 is coming from here, here. Put an arrow. All right, good. And now I just need to plug in 5 into f. So that's 5 squared minus 5. And that will just be 20. Okay. Mm, all right. Okay, we'll do this. All right. Okay, good. Uh, let's just do one more practice. We're going to go back now to just finding composition of functions. We're just going to do uh, just one more practice of that. So, so just uh, some more. more practice finding uh, compositions. Right, just because it's very fundamental and very important, especially if some of you guys are going to be going into more advanced math classes in the future. Um, okay, so here's the example. Um, I'm going to let f of x be x squared plus 1, and I will let g of x be the square root of x plus 2. And I believe, right, so for this example, um, I'm, just, I'm just going to ask to find f of g of x. All right, so that's the so that's the prompt here. Find f of g of x. Okay, so f of g of x. Here we go. So, so I write f. Open up parentheses. Um, I replace g of x with, with, with its formula, and g of x's formula is the square root of x plus two. Okay, so I hope everyone sees that. And now I go to the formula for f, and wherever I see an x, I plug in the square root of x plus 2. 
okay? So I have x squared, so I ought to replace x squared with the square root of x plus two squared, okay? So that's the highlighted portion. That's where I plugged in for x. And then there is a plus one, plus one. All right, so I hope everyone sees how I obtained this formula. I'm just gonna say it again. I plugged in the square root of x plus two in for x in the formula for f. Okay, and this actually simplifies quite nicely. The square and the square root will undo each other, so I'm just left with the radicand, okay? So that's x. Sorry about that. Okay, um, so that I'm just left with, so the square and the square root cancel, so I'm just left with the radicand, which is x plus two, and then the plus one also comes down, and this is just x plus three. Can I confirm something actually? So the, the square root x plus two, Wait, actually, no, the, if you scroll up a little bit, can I see the, okay, so you see the f of x equals x squared plus one. You just add, you just add the, the square to the, to where the square root of x plus two is, right? Because the x is already square root x plus two, right? Um, yes, kind of, kind okay, of. Yeah, because I'm, I'm like confused a little bit about that. Yeah, so let's just. Let's just kind of do it again a little slowly. So I have x squared plus one, right? And the notation f of the square root of x plus two, that means that we're, and, and this was f of x. This means that wherever I see an x in the formula for f, I need to replace it with the square root of x plus two. So I plug that in for x. Okay now, okay, now I get it. So the square just stays. So I'll write it. So now this will be, I replace x, so it's something squared, and what is squared is, is x, but I replace x with the square root of x plus 2. Okay, now I got it. Thank you so much. This one. Yep, got it. Okay, so that's that example. All right, so I think we're going to move on to domain. Yeah. Let me move on to the one second. Okay, so uh, next topic will be uh, finding the uh, finding the domain of a composite function. Okay. Okay, so I'll start off with some sort of motivating example. So let me just write a bit. So uh, consider, consider the problem of finding the, finding the domain for the composition for the composition f of g of x, where, so I'm gonna tell you what f and g are now, where f of x is equal to five over x minus one, and g of x is equal to four over three x minus two. Okay, so this is kind of the motivating example. We're gonna be interested in finding the domain of this composition. Okay, so firstly, um, we, see, we see that x equals 2 thirds, 2 over 3, is not in the domain for g of x. Okay, 
Reason being is because if I were to plug in x equals two thirds in for g, it would cause me to divide by zero, which of course is not allowed. <clears throat> and to find this x value, you can just set three x minus two to be equal to zero and solve for x. Okay, so that's the first note. Okay, x equals two thirds is not in the domain for g. And also, we also need to also examine the domain of f, but also x equals one is not in the domain for f. Hope everyone sees that. If I plug in one into f, it would also cause me to divide by zero. Okay, but also x equals one is not in the domain for f of x. Okay, so I hope, so I hope that, is, that is clear. Okay, and the reason why I'm saying this is because we need to figure out which x values will make g of x equal one and exclude that from the domain. Because if g of x were to be equal to one, that's equivalent to me plugging in one into f, which is not good. Okay, so let me, so let me just write that. So, so we, so we, um, so we must see which x value makes g of x equal one and also exclude this from the domain and also exclude this x value from the domain. Okay. Just real quick, um, how do we see that x equals two thirds would make g divide by zero? So, oh, so for that one, you just have to set, you just have to set the bottom equal to zero and uh, solve for x. Okay. So you want to see which x values will produce a zero in the bottom? Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So three x equals two, and then x equals two thirds. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Okay. But also, we also need to make sure, we need to figure out which x value will make g of x equal one and exclude it. Because if g was equal to one, it's the same as f of one, which is not valid. f is not defined at one, okay? So this is a kind of a subtle kind of point. Um, so I hope it's, it's clear. Okay, anyways, we need to actually solve this. So, so to find this x value, it's not that bad. You just solve uh, g of x equals one and exclude it. After solving, you exclude it from the domain. So that's it. So what's G? I mean, let me just scroll up. G is four over three X minus two. This is four over three X minus two. I set it equal to one. And now this is just a rational equation like from the first week of class, All right? So um, you can just multiply both sides by three X minus two and you would get that four is equal to three X minus two. Good, and this is now six is equal to three X, which is X equals two solution. Okay, so remember, this is the value that makes G of X equal one, which is F of one, which is invalid. So we need to exclude X equals two from the domain. Okay, so overall, overall, the domain of the composition f of g of x is all real numbers except except two thirds and two. Okay, and I'm getting the two thirds from, from the domain of G. Okay, two thirds is not a valid input for G. 
and one is not a valid input for f, so I need to figure out where g of x is one, and that happens precisely at x equals two. So I need to exclude those values. Okay, and of course, we always love interval notation in this class. I'm sure you guys are sick of that, but it is important. So just in interval notation, this is how we're going to notate it. It's going to be um, minus infinity to two thirds parenthesis union two thirds comma two parentheses and also the final piece two comma infinity. Okay, so that would be the answer to this. All right, so we're gonna, so that was kind of just like a motivational instructional example. And now I'm just going to write out kind of like the formal set of steps for solving, uh, for answering these types of questions. All right, I just wanted you guys to see where these steps are going to come from and not just blindly apply the steps. Okay, so steps. So here, here we go. So to, to find the, to find the domain of a composition, to find the domain of a composition f, g of x. Okay, here you do the following. Step one, find the domain of g, which is the input, which is the, the inner, the inner function. Find the domain of g. Okay, so scrolling up to our previous example, we did that when we excluded two thirds from the domain. Okay, so that was that. Step two is to find the domain of f. Okay, and three, exclude exclude inputs x for which for which g of x is not for which g of x is not in the domain of f okay and up in our example, that was this whole business of seeing where g of x was equal to 1 and then excluding that x value from our domain. So that was step 3. Okay. All right. Very, very nice. So now let's do another example. All right. So we're going to let f of x... Uh, 1 over x squared minus 1, and I'll let g of x be the square root of x plus 1. Okay, and the prompt is to find the domain. Find the domain of the composition f of g of x. Okay, so step one was to find the domain of G. So let's do that. So domain of G. Okay, so G, what type of function is G? G is a square root. And to take care of the domain of square root functions, we have to set the radicand to be greater than or equal to zero and solve. So the radicand here is X plus one. And I set that to be greater than or equal to zero and solve. Okay, and this is um, not that hard to solve. The answer to this inequality is x is greater than or equal to negative 1. Okay, not done yet. So we just took care of the inner function. Now, we also need to find the domain of f. The domain of f. Okay, so f... So I can factor that x squared minus 1 
that's present in x. So that's so one over x squared minus one. That's a difference of two squares. That's the same as one over x minus one and x plus one. Okay, so now I need to see which x values are going to cause me to divide by zero. And I hope it's clear that the domain of f, it's going to be all real numbers, except x can't be equal to 1, and x cannot be equal to negative 1. Okay, because that would cause f to be divided by 0, which is not allowed. Okay, now the third step, which is probably the most subtle thing, we need to see which x values create these trouble spots for uh, which x, how can I phrase this? We need to figure out which x values make g of x equal to these trouble spots. Okay, so now you solve two equations. You solve g of x is equal to one, and you also solve g of x is equal to minus one. So you solve both of these guys and exclude from the domain. Okay, so we need to ensure, so we need to figure out where g of x is one and negative one and then take those bad numbers out from our domain. Okay, so g of x equals one. That is the square root of x plus one equals one. So we're gonna solve this and we're also solving the square root of x plus one is equal to minus one. Okay, let me just look at the at the right at the at the second equation on the right side here. I hope you guys agree that there is actually no solution to this to this one. Okay, there's no way that a a square root can produce a negative. Number. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this one has no solution, so there's really nothing to worry about. Now the one on the left, x plus one is equal to one. You can actually just square both sides to get rid of the square root. I know we didn't cover how to solve these types of, of equations, but I think it's not that bad to just show you on the fly. So the square root of x plus one equals one. I can square both sides of that equation and I will get x plus one is equal to one. And this has a solution of x equals zero. Good, so, so we exclude. So we have to exclude this solution. All right, the solution is not a good number. We have to exclude it. We exclude x equals zero from the domain. Wait, um, Mr. Um, Mr. Roberts, um, what, what, what do you mean for the other one that has no solution? Wouldn't it be the same, zero? Well, you see what's going on is that um, how the, the square root of a number will never produce negative one. Oh, okay. Now, I see what you're saying. Yes, I can also square both sides of this equation and I obtain the same thing on the left side, right? Yeah. Sometimes when you square both sides of an equation, you get extraneous solutions. You get like fake solutions and you have to go back and check. Okay. See if they're legitimate solutions. Okay. Yeah. But just intuitively, you can see the right side has no equation because the square root can never be equal to negative one. All right, so we exclude zero from the domain. So let's now recap all of our restrictions. So x has to be greater than negative one, and at the same time, it cannot be zero. So this is how we do it in interval notation. So, so we don't include zero because it will what, cause us to divide by? Yes, because if I plug in zero into f of g of x, Mm -hmm. That's the same as f of 1, because g of 0 is equal to 1. Mm -hmm. And f of 1 is undefined, because it causes us, to, causes us to divide by 0. Gotcha. Good. So x has to be greater than, greater than or equal to negative 1, and also not be equal to 0. So that's going to be a bracket around negative 1 comma zero, parenthesis around zero, and then union zero comma infinity. 
All right, and just make note of the parentheses around zero. We're not including zero in our domain. Extraneous means what? Like fake solutions? Fake solutions, yeah. Okay. yeah. So that can happen sometimes when you square both sides of square both sides of an equation, it can produce these uh, fake solutions. And that's actually a result of the x squared function not being one to one. That's the reasoning as to why um, it, it can lead to fake solutions, because x squared is not one to one. All right, so that's that. Um, good, so we're gonna do another example. But in this case, it would still, but, but in this case, you would still exclude zero either way if you solve for both or no? Because when I set x, uh, the square root of x plus one equal to one, mm -hmm. um, I can square both sides. I got x equals zero. And then you have to kind of go back and check to see if it's a real solution. Okay. And it was, because if I plug in x equals zero, I get the square root of one, which is one. Okay. It does work, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I hope that that was your question. Was it? Yep. Uh, so next example is actually slightly easier. Um, so this would be f of x is equal to 1 over x plus 3, and g of x is equal to 1 over x minus 9. x minus 9. And, uh, and, and the question is to find... find the domain of f of g of x. Okay, so the steps are no different than before. We first find the domain of the inner function, g of x. So step one, domain of g. Domain of G. Okay, so it should be pretty clear that the domain of G is going to be all numbers except nine. Okay, so domain of G is just going to be X is not equal to nine because, okay, reason being, um, it would cause us to divide by zero. So that's, that's first. Next, you find the domain of the outer function F. All right, and in the same exact way, the domain of f, I hope it, it's, it's pretty easy to see, it's x cannot be equal to minus three. Okay, now we need to see which x values will make g of x equal to negative three and exclude from the domain. So you solve g of x is equal to negative three and exclude. Okay, so the solution in this case is not, um, you have to exclude it, okay? And exclude this from domain. All right, and that's, and that's not too bad. So I'm just going to solve g of x is equal to negative three. So g of x is equal to one over x minus nine. So one basically you're looking for the value that will equal to negative three. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm figuring out which x value makes g of x equal to negative 3. And then you also have to exclude that too. That x value. Yeah. Yes. I'm not excluding negative 3. I'm excluding the x value that makes g equal to negative 3. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so again, this is, a, uh, this is a rational equation like we did a few weeks ago. Um, one way to do it is just to multiply both sides by x minus 9. So you get 1 is equal to negative 3 times x minus 9. Good. 1 is equal to negative 3x. Now I'm just going to distribute the minus 3 in, into the parentheses. I get negative 3x plus 27. Um, so this is now 3x is equal to 26. And x will be 26 over 3. Right, so I kind of went through those algebra steps kind of fast, um, but just go back and convince yourself of that. Okay, so overall, here are our exclusions. Um, we exclude x equals 9, 
and x equals 26 over 3 from the domain. So these are not included as solutions then? Well, solutions is not the right word to use. Uh, they're just these x values are not permissible to plug into our function. Okay. Not allowed. Okay, so where did I get x equals 9 from? Remember, x equals 9 is not valid because it would cause me to divide by 0 for g. And then x equals 26 over 3 we got from this step here. And then everyone's favorite, uh, in interval notation, this will look like, so this is just some good practice for interval notation. It's going to be negative infinity, comma, 26 over 3, union. 26 over 3, uh, comma 9, union 9 infinity. Okay. So that would be the answer. All right. So that's going to wrap up our, our discussion on composition of functions. Okay. So I hope, so, so does anyone have any uh, questions? Because now we're going to shift gears into a kind of new topic. Okay, um, so we're going to start a new unit, which is actually going to span across two lectures. Um, and it's called uh, transformations of functions. Okay, so what's the deal with this? So given, given a function um, f of x, we can, we can create uh, new functions. We can create new functions that, that are some transformation some transformation of f of x uh, quite easily. Okay. Okay. So the first, uh, so the first transformation we're going to talk about is called a vertical shift. Vertical shift. So what does this, what does this mean? So again, given a function, given a function f of x, the new function, the new function uh, g of x, which is just going to be f of x plus k is a vertical shift vertical shift of f of x by k units and we also just talk about the case whether that number k is positive or negative so firstly if that number k is greater than zero uh, the graph will shift upwards the graph will shift upwards. And if k is less than zero, uh, the graph will shift downwards. Okay, all right, so that's how it works. Uh, you just take your function and you add some constant to it and that results in a vertical shift. So let's do an example and then I'm gonna go and do a nice interactive uh, 
demo with this too. So firstly, um, let, let uh, f of x be x squared, okay? So now let's apply some sort of vertical transformation to this guy. Um, so the new, so the new function, g of x equals x squared plus one, will shift the graph of f of x equals x squared up by one unit. Okay, up by one unit. So f of x is like the parent function. Exactly. Okay. F of X, it's those so-called parent functions or toolkit functions that I uh, defined last class, exactly. So X squared is being transformed. It's being uh, vertically shifted up by one unit, and that's because of this plus one right here. All right, and algebraically, so that's the graphical interpretation. The graph is going to shift up by one, but algebraically, um, this, this translates to adding one to each output value of f of x. All right. So now I'm just going to go to a demo um, and just kind of show this in real time. So I'm just going to share my browser right now. Anyways, what I have here graphed is, so in this red graph, I just have x squared, just like we were doing before. And this g of x is going to be x squared plus k. If I move this slider up, you're going to see the graph actually shift upwards, okay, just as I described. So look, if I move the the graph up, if I move the slider up, visually you can see that the function x squared is being vertically shifted up, all right? And if I make k negative, as I said, a k being negative translates to a shift down. So there we go. So that's how it looks in real time, all right? So this is just some evidence that um, the transformation is actually doing a vertical shift. All right, so hopefully that's <clears throat> that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to go back to my notes. Okay. So would K be the y-intercept? What's up? Would K be the y-intercept? Um, in this case, yes. Whatever K is, that's going to be where it crosses the x-axis. Got it. I mean, uh, the y-axis. Yes. But it won't. It won't always be like that. Um, no, because if I were to do like a horizontal shift and then a vertical shift, it, it wouldn't be that way. Got it. Thank you. But in this case, definitely. Okay. So now let's do um, another kind of example using a vertical shift. So um, consider the... So function given by the table. Okay, so I'm just going to write out a function in table form as we've been dealing with. So I'll have one column be x, and I'll have uh, the second column be f of x. Okay, so the function is defined as this. 2 gets output to 1. 4 gets mapped to 3, 6 gets mapped to 7, and 8 gets mapped to 11. Okay, so this is just, um, this is not a function in a formula. This is just given to us as a table. Okay, and the task is to uh, create a table for the function um, 
g of x is equal to f of x minus 3. Okay, so this is not that bad. So as you guys saw in that demo that I just showed on my browser, doing these vertical shifts just changes the y values. The x values are staying exactly the same. It's just the vertical component is changing. All right, and that is just the y values are changing. Okay, so all you have to do is all you do is just uh, subtract three from the output values from the output values of f. Okay, that's all that needs to be done. So I'm just going to do that quickly. So we have a column for x, and now we have a column for our new function g. The inputs stay exactly the same. Okay, so 2, 4, 6, 8 are going to stay the same. 2, 4, 6, 8. However, I'm going to subtract 3 from the output column. All right, so that is 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. I get 3 minus 3, which is 0. Uh, 7 minus 3, which is 4. And then the last one is 11. I have to do 11 minus 3, uh, which is 8. And this is it. This is the table. All right, so that is vertical shifts. So just to recap, vertical shifts will is of the form f of x plus k, and it's going to shift the graph vertically up or down k units, and algebraically that translates to adding or subtracting k units from the outputs. All right, and the last thing for tonight, the uh, so the next transformation we'll talk about are horizontal shifts. So we just did vertical shifts. Now let's do horizontal shifts. Okay, so again, <clears throat> Again, uh, given a function uh, f of x, the new function, the function um, f of x plus h is, so it's not going to be a vertical shift this time. Now the, the plus h is in the input of f. So it's actually a horizontal shift is a horizontal shift um, of f of x by h units, by h units. Okay, and whether h is positive or negative is going to determine whether we're shifting to the left or right. And now let's see how that plays out. So, so this is kind of tricky. So if h is greater than 0, meaning if it's positive, the graph will shift. So if h is positive, it's actually going to shift to the left, which is maybe the opposite of what you would think. So it's going to shift to the left if h is positive. All right, and of what's left is if h is negative. If h is less than zero, the graph will shift right. All right, so very important right here. Okay, this is something that I've seen commonly gotten wrong is these two points here. If h is positive, the graph will shift left, actually. If it's negative, it will shift right. OK, so first example. First example. Let um, f of x be equal to the absolute value of x. So that's our function. All 
Okay, and now we're going to define a new function. Um, the function g of x, which I'm going to be equal to f of x minus 2. Okay, so now notice this is actually a function composition. I'm plugging in x minus 2 in for x. That's going to be um, the absolute value of x minus 2. All right, so I hope everyone sees how it went from here to here. Okay, anyways, what does this function g do? Um, the function g of x will uh, shift will shift the graph of f of x to the right. To, uh, we'll shift the graph of f of x to the right by two units. OK, and why is it right? OK, it's right because h here is negative 2, which is less than 0. And now we go to our bullet points. If h is less than 0, the graph will shift right. Well, h here is negative 2, which is obviously less than 0. OK. Um, I'm just trying to think if I should do something I have in my notes. Okay, all right, so I'm going to go back to that graph thing that I did for vertical shifts, um, but now I'll do it for horizontal shifts. So let me just share my browser quickly. <clears throat> okay, so where's my vertical, sh where's my horizontal shift? Okay, so here we have just the example from before, uh, f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And now look at my function g of x, it's just a horizontal shift of f of x. Now, if h is less than 0, I wrote that the graph shifts to the right. So if I move the slider to be negative, we should see the graph shift to the right. Let's see if that happens. It's not happening. Oh, I know why, because this should be plus h. OK, anyway, so let's, let's go back. OK, so as I said, um, if h is negative, it should shift the graph to the right. And yep, I'm making h negative, and it is shifting the graph to the right, as I said. And similarly, if I make h positive, it does shift the graph to the left. Okay, so this is just, uh, just some evidence uh, to see that if h is negative, you actually do go to the right, which is maybe the opposite of what you think would happen. So that's that. Okay, so any questions? I'll, I'll do uh, one example and then uh, we'll finish for tonight. Right, let me just go to my notes. We'll do the last example of the evening. Okay, a example. What is the formula? What is the formula for shifting the graph of f of x seven units down and for 
units left. Okay, so we have two transformations happening simultaneously. Uh, we have a seven unit down and we have a four unit left. Let me take care of <clears throat> each of them separately. So let's just talk about the seven units down. So seven units down will translate to a vertical shift down by seven, which will just be f of x minus seven. Good. Now, so this was down seven. And now my next thing, I wanna do four units left. Okay, so four units to the left means I need to do x plus four in the input for f. So this just comes to be f of x plus four minus seven. Okay, so the left is intimately related to the plus sign, okay? If it was a minus sign, it would be four units to the right. That, okay. Um, so that's pretty much it. Okay, I do have one more Desmos activity I wanted to show you, and then we'll be done. So, uh, uh, Mr. Roberts? Yeah. We don't put this in um, absolute form, like what, like for x plus 4, we don't put it in the absolute bar, or oh. does it matter in this case? No, okay, so in this example, f of x was just some abstract function. Oh. It was not the specific example from before. Okay. It was just any function f of x, yeah. I should have been clear about that. All right, final little interactive thing. But uh, but generally, when speaking about um, no, I'm sorry. But but generally, when if you were to graph any function that has absolute bars, it would just be related to something dealing with transformations. Um. So, like, it's like the one is like it's like the one you have on the board. I mean, oh, the the previous one where x plus h in the uh, absolute value bars. Yes. Um. What we just did that example could be applied to the example of f of x equals the absolute value of h. It would shift it four units to the left and seven units down. Got it. Yeah. Um, in fact, why don't we actually do that? Let's actually do that one. Okay, so here I have the parent function graph f of x is equal to the absolute value of x, and this g of x is a horizontal and vertical shift. So we have the plus h and the plus k, let me graph exactly what we did in the last example, seven units down. So seven units down means I need to make k here, this plus k, be minus seven. So I go to negative seven. And then I need to shift four units to the left. And that translates to a plus four for f of x plus h, so f of x plus four. So we need to make h equal to four. And there, and there you have it. All right, so we just took our parent function or toolkit function, absolute value of x, and we applied this transformation to it. And we got the blue, the blue curve.